coral reefs. In a vast blue wilderness, they are the cities of the sea. These rich, biodiverse ecosystems are hotspots for marine life and warriors at protecting shorelines from storms. They cover 1% of the ocean floor, but they're actually home or host to about 25% of marine species. Coral reefs are also the economic driver behind many economies around the world. They provide a critical food source for millions of people. The Florida Reef Track provides over 70,000 local jobs and is estimated to be worth over $6 billion to our state economy. Well, they say there's only one Everglades, but there's also only one Florida Reef Tract, and it's a really special place. Like most coral reefs around the world, the Florida Reef Tract has declined over the past few decades. Fishing pressures, pollution, development, and climate change have all left their mark. Now, a new disease may be the last nail in the coffin. They're stressed and they get disease. They're more susceptible to it. This disease is unprecedented in its scale, size, and its effect on coral reefs in the Florida Reef Tract. We're kind of up against these ticking time bombs of losing corals every day and trying to implement the best strategies that we have while simultaneously trying to develop new ideas. What is this disease? What are scientists doing to prevent the spread? And will it be enough? Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by the William J. and Tina Rosenberg Foundation. The Do Unto Others Trust. And by the following. It all began in Southeast Florida. In 2013, researchers here at Nova Southeastern were conducting monitoring of the reef systems and they noticed a white disease pop up in some of the corals. And it was just one site in Broward County, one site in Dade County. Unlike other diseases that may concentrate in small areas and often disappear with the change of seasons, this one continued. It reached the northern extent of the Florida Reef Track in 2016 in Martin County, and it first appeared in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary in 2016. And we believe because of its rapid movement that it was following the water currents and is a waterborne disease. By early 2019, the disease had reached Key West. Corals can show signs that they're sick a couple different ways. They can be pale and bleached, which suggests that they're stressed and they're losing their symbiotic algae that live inside the tissue. Coral can still be alive and recover from the bleaching if the stress that caused it is removed. Or they can lose their tissue over time. And this disease can show both of those signs, but predominantly it's the sloughing off of tissue of the coral animal, leaving just exposed white skeleton. Experts named it stony coral tissue loss disease because of how it manifests in hard coral species. Reef building corals are what are called stony corals mainly because they produce a limestone skeleton. We have about 45 hard coral species on the Florida Reef Tract and we estimate at least half of those are susceptible to this disease. It actually affects more species than any other coral disease that's been reported to date. Within the Florida Keys Reef Tract, Scientists say once the disease emerges in a new area, it affects anywhere from 50 to 100 percent of the stony corals there. After a coral is infected, it will likely die within one to six months. 
Experts of varying backgrounds are collaborating to study this unprecedented disease. One of them is Dr. Brian Walker, who has spent most of his career mapping the seafloor and describing reef habitats off southeast Florida prior to the disease outbreak. When I first started doing my mapping work, there wasn't a lot of knowledge about the extent of the reef system and how far north it went and the habitat types. While studying the underwater topography, Brian discovered nearly 300 giant boulder corals that are over six feet in diameter, estimated to be up to 300 years old. About half of them are dead, and we don't know when they died. Could have been previous stress events, could have been early in the century or just a few years ago. To avoid losing the remaining living boulder corals to stony coral tissue loss disease, Brian and his team switched their focus to monitoring and treating the infected corals. We've been using a specific epoxy that was tested through researchers in the past that they found was effective. And that allows us to mix chlorine and the epoxy together underwater and then apply it. It will kill the tissue on immediate contact so that we are removing that diseased tissue from the environment. As a backup, we create this trench in the healthy looking live tissue of the coral that we fill with epoxy with chlorine as a break between the healthy live tissue and the diseased tissue. So if that diseased tissue spreads beyond the margin treatment, it will hopefully only spread to that point, to that trench. Our treatments have been between 40 and 60% effective at stopping the disease progression across the coral once it's been infected. But we can't stop the coral from getting disease in another location. And so it requires this constant effort and monitoring. While Brian and his team work towards protecting the large boulder corals in Broward County, his colleague, Dr. Karen Neely, focuses on the affected species in the Florida Keys. Key is one of the jewels of the Florida Reef Act. It was protected even before the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary came in. You have really high coral cover and really beautiful reef structure. It's really hard to watch that reef currently in decline and see all of the devastation that's happening because of this tissue loss disease. My main research goal right now is looking at intervention strategies. Is there anything we can do to treat affected corals or to protect unaffected corals that might give them a chance to survive through this disease event and still be there at the end to help repopulate and restore the reefs in the future? A lot of the efforts that we have to address this disease are trial and error. We basically do things in a laboratory and see whether it works. And then we have to pilot in the field and look at first whether it works and then second what sort of implications that has for the corals we're trying to treat as well as the other organisms on that reef system before we make a decision to move forward with something that's done on a larger scale. What we're primarily working with now is antibiotic delivery. And what we're trying to do with that is maximize delivery to the coral, minimizing delivery to the water column, and also creating basically a time release mechanism. Two of the methods that we are trying for antibiotic delivery right now are both paste that we can smear onto the disease margin. One of these is basic shea butter, and it's easy to get, it's relatively cheap, and it's something that we can use pretty easily in the field to deliver this drug to the coral. Another potential method that we've been working with comes from a company that is based out of Tampa. Actively treating the disease isn't the only way Karen is trying to help save Florida's iconic coral reefs. Together with Keys Marine Lab Deputy Director, Dr. Cindy Lewis, Karen's been rescuing threatened pillar corals from the reef since 2016, 
before the stony coral tissue loss disease reached the area. Pillar coral is very near and dear to my heart. It's the only coral anywhere in the world that grows these big columns or cylinders that can be 10 feet tall and sometimes two feet in diameter. It's one of the few species that has its polyps out during the day, so it looks very fuzzy and fluffy, not just at night. The pillar coral only occurs in the Caribbean. It's considered threatened because of its low abundance, its susceptibility to disease, and its sensitivity to changing environmental stressors. And there are only about 160 genotypes that we identified on the reef. So think of that like the last 160 or so people on this planet. And not only that, they only occurred at about 150 different sites. So think of that as 160 people living in 150 different towns. So they were spread out across the reef, very low genetic diversity, and because we were losing them, from these bleaching events and subsequent disease, we realized that we needed to bring some of this genetic material into these protected onshore nurseries like we have here at Keys Marine Lab. Each pillar coral is assigned a unique number, so experts have a record of where it was collected and what condition it was in at the time. Meanwhile, they continue to monitor the status of all the remaining pillar corals in the wild. We've lost you know, well more than 50% of the genetics out on the reef. They're extinct now, and many of them are only held now in the onshore nurseries. Preserving each and every genotype is really important for preserving that genetic diversity that we can use in the future. To save the population, scientists are rearing pillar corals in captivity. In the summer of 2018, 69 different coral fragments of 27 different genotypes were being cared for at the Keys Marine Lab. They spawned in the tanks, males and females that probably haven't seen each other in maybe centuries. <laughs> and we have 30 brand new babies, and that means 30 new genotypes in this population. The success of the Pillar Coral Rescue Project came at the ideal time. Now, the staff at the Keys Marine Lab is using techniques they perfected while working with the pillar corals to house various other species that are also threatened by stony coral tissue loss disease. The eventual goal is to restore the species to the reef once the disease outbreak has abated. While experts are actively working to treat and rescue corals, one big question remains. What is causing this disease? Everybody is concerned about is why are the corals diseased and what's causing it? Is it a pathogen or is it some environmental stressor? Researchers at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's Fish and Wildlife Research Institute are taking a microscopic look at what may be occurring in the coral tissue. What we can do is look at how a diseased tissue looks and then compare that with what appears to be a normal tissue. The actual methods used uh, are pretty much the same as if someone has a biopsy where a small piece of tissue is removed. To analyze a tissue sample, the hard coral skeleton is dissolved away, and the remaining tissue and associated surface organisms are preserved in a gelatinous substance that holds them in place. There's just a lot of different organisms that could be there, and we wouldn't really necessarily know. It's like looking at a zoo of stuff. You just have no idea what, if any, are actually involved in the disease. Next, the block of tissue is finely sliced and different chemicals are used to stain varying slices of the sample. Each chemical highlighting different features in the tissue, such as the nucleus of the cell, mucus, or bacteria. We're looking possibly at uh, trying to find any pathogens that we might be able to see microscopically. Uh, and also understanding how the normal tissue has changed. 
where you see these like white patchy areas, this is the disease itself, the lesion. And you can see where it's really white space. It's like the tissue is gone. Scientists have found that the disease appears to be occurring in the deeper layer, what's called the gastrodermis, of several different species affected by stony coral tissue loss disease. They're kind of structurally different, but nonetheless, the, the way the lesions look internally is very similar. And we've seen that in five different species. So it seems to be a commonality that may help us understand you know, how the disease is manifesting. We've seen what look like these crystalline inclusion bodies that are diamond shaped or rhomboid in the tissue, sometimes near the lesion area. And we have no sense yet of what they are, but they may be important or they may not be. So we'll certainly be pursuing looking at those to see if we can find out what they are. To help identify the microbes found in the coral tissues, Jan is collaborating with multiple organizations, including Moat Marine Laboratory's Coral Health and Disease Program, led by Dr. Aaron Muller. With the stony coral tissue loss disease, we, we still don't know what the primary pathogen is, but we do believe that it is a microbe and a lot of the evidence is suggesting that it's a bacteria, primarily because when you apply antibiotics to a diseased coral, that progression seems to stop. We want to understand how does it transmit from a diseased coral to a healthy coral, and hopefully be able to identify the pathogen that could be responsible for that transmission that's occurring. So what we do is we go collect diseased corals from the reef and bring them back to an isolated lab We'll have a diseased coral within a tank, and then we'll have different microfragments touching the diseased coral to see if, over time, within a few days usually, that disease could transmit to the microfragments. If all the tissue just kind of sloughs off of the skeleton of the microfragment, it would suggest that the disease had indeed transmitted. If that coral stays beautifully colored, appears to not have suffered any tissue loss, then it would suggest that it was resistant to that transmission of the disease. So once a coral gets sick from the disease transmission, the progress continues until the entire coral is dead. There's been some evidence in the field that the disease may slow down at times, but for the majority, it appears that once a coral gets sick, the entire colony is going to be lost. Aaron takes samples of the coral microfragments throughout the transmission experiment to figure out how their microbes change through time as the corals fight the disease or become sick. To get the information from the corals, we basically scrape off some of the tissue and put that tissue into a preserving agent that allows us to then extract the DNA out of that sample. It contains DNA from everything that was in your sample, the coral, the bacteria, the algae, the viruses, the fungi. But for our focus right now, we're really interested in the bacterial community. And we're still trying to figure out what's good bacteria for coral and what's the bad bacteria for coral. And so by us taking samples and analyzing and characterizing the bacterial community, we can compare what's present within diseased corals with what's present within healthy corals and hopefully identify some of those potential pathogenic bacteria that are there and maybe even causing the tissue loss disease. Our preliminary results are really encouraging and we have definitely seen a different signature of bacteria within diseased corals when we compare them to healthy corals that are in the same reef locations. We have a couple different bacteria species that seem to definitely have a role within this disease outbreak. But whether or not they're the pathogen, we need to fulfill follow-up studies to really see if it's a cause and effect or an association or even potentially just a secondary infection that's not the primary pathogen of the disease. Aaron's transmission studies are also helping to identify genotypes of corals that appear to be resistant to the disease. This information is valuable to Moat Marine Laboratory and other organizations that are restoring corals on the reef. Now this is the perfect yeah. 
chip right here. One person involved in restoration efforts is Ken Niedemeyer. He began growing corals in the wild in 2002 and later founded the Coral Restoration Foundation. Years ago, I set out to show people that we could grow and raise corals offshore and, and regrow them and plant them on the coral reefs. We went from one coral to tens of thousands of corals. Corals are unique in their ability to reproduce sexually by spawning and asexually through fragmentation. The Coral Restoration Foundation uses the fragmentation process by trimming a piece of coral into smaller fragments. We then glue that little piece of coral onto a card that we had previously printed that had the genus and species and the particular genotype or number that we had assigned to it. Each card is placed on a coral restoration tree to grow in their offshore nurseries. Once they reach a certain size, corals of identical genotypes are outplanted in clusters onto the reef, where they will eventually fuse together to create new colonies. So one single colony that's you know, the size of half a basketball could start to sexually reproduce in two years. That same colony would take 15 years to grow from a baby. We're trying to step up the whole process. You know, the goal is to get these things breeding again. The cornerstone of our restoration program is preserving and maintaining and outplanting genetic diversity. With the idea being that we want to mimic as much natural diversity that was on the reef 40 years ago. One genotype might be resistant to coral bleaching, to high heat temperatures. One genotype might be more resistant to disease. So we want to make sure that we're sort of trying to hit every single possibility that the climate could throw at us. And hoping that once these outplanted populations sexually reproduce and spawn, they will form new genotypes and those new genotypes will be more resilient, more resistant to future changes in the climate. As of early 2019, the Coral Restoration Foundation's offshore nursery contained five species affected by stony coral tissue loss disease, including 72 genotypes of threatened boulder coral, as well as a few genotypes of threatened pillar coral. Without our intervention, without our active practice, these corals won't come back on their own. So our goal is to rebuild these populations, start to put out corals in the abundance and diversity that they were historically known to have. And by doing that, we hope that we can start to connect populations that are too separate right now to spawn and recruit on their own. Over the years, I've been fortunate to witness the field of restoration grow. There's more practices emerging and this community is really starting to expand and come together. This is part of a solution. It's not the only part of a solution, but we've been a part of, of changing the way people feel about coral reefs and about the future. We've given them hope. This disease has been devastating. When you dive these reefs on a week-to-week, month-to-month basis, you have some favorite corals. It may sound silly, but we have Archie and we have Big Daddy. And I've got the baby elephant, which was a beautiful, huge brain coral. And when I see these things now, I literally cry. This is a hard issue to raise awareness on. There's so much going on in the world and in people's lives. Um, and this one is really hard to see. You not only have to be out there diving or snorkeling, but you also have to understand what a coral is and what a dead coral looks like and what the implications of losing these coral colonies are. The stony coral tissue loss disease has had a devastating impact on Florida's fragile reef ecosystem. But all hope is not lost. Dedicated scientists are working hard to find the cause of the disease, treat the ill, and restore these cities of the sea to their former glory. I believe it's really important that people understand that it doesn't mean the end of the Florida Keys reef system. Corals are really, really unique, resilient animals that I believe can rebound. And as long as humans do a better job of trying to take care of our oceans. I think that can really make a difference in helping us address this coral disease outbreak. There's never been as much effort
put into place to understand a coral disease, to try and stop a disease from spreading, to try and save the corals that are out there and hopefully put new ones back out onto the reef environment. The collaborative effort the amount of dedication that scientists and the community have really put into trying to understand what's going on and trying to fight this outbreak is unprecedented. And I'm glad that I'm a part of it and hopefully we'll be making a big difference that is going to set a precedent for other outbreaks related to coral reefs around the world. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by the William J. and Tina Rosenberg Foundation, the Do Unto Others Trust, and by the following. <laughs>